Okay, hello. Um, so, uh, unless there are any questions, I'm going to just start talking right away about Locke. All right. So, um, I mean, I could go more into the stuff I was starting to say at the end about substance. I think I'm going to put that off because we're going to, the things about substances are going to come back when we talk about the names of substances, and maybe it'll be best to talk about it then. So I'm going to go on to, um, well, there's three topics I want to discuss. And um, so one of them I sort of started last time. And it's kind of three things mixed together. One of them is Locke's view about freedom of the will. Are you writing on the board right now? I am, and my camera is not. Yeah. I'm going to try some new software called. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't think I can get it. I'm getting a green screen. I think that'll make it work better. Yeah, sorry. I went from bad to worse. <laughs> no, no. It's just because I have to reconnect the camera. There it is. Okay. All right. So maybe next week I'll try that out. But for now, I'm still using many cam, which seems to leave something to be desired. All right. Um... So freedom was one topic, Locke's view of freedom of the will, morality, Locke's view about moral good and evil, and what goes together with both of them, Locke's view about personal identity. Um, so I did get to mention identity uh, briefly last time. Um, I guess that was... So that was, the entity is chapter 27, which was actually part of the reading for last time, right? I got confused about that at the end. But anyway, um, so uh, these three things go together. So that's the first topic I want to discuss. And then I want to discuss these classifications, especially, I mean, also to some extent, the one about distinct versus confused and um clear versus obscure, but mostly this distinction that Locke makes between adequate and inadequate ideas. And then finally, the third topic is association of ideas, um, or what Locke calls madness. I mean, he calls it association of ideas also, but he calls it madness. Um, so I hope I will get to all three of those, and I'm going to be begin talking about the first one right away. Um, so, uh, and first, the first thing on the list, freedom of the will. Um, so... Um, Locke defines freedom or liberty I think he, he uses these terms as um, synonyms he defines freedom or liberty or liberty um, as a power so I mean first of all this is just another example of a power right he's always talking about powers um, so a power, of course, only makes sense compared to an operation, right? The power is the capability or the faculty, the uh, ability to um, actually be in a certain state, whether if it's an active power, it's the power for me to do that. And if it's a passive power, it's a power for that to happen to me. So what is the, um, 
operation that corresponds to freedom, or in other words, what is the free, what is freedom the power to do? And the answer is, it's a power to do or forbear. as I prefer. So, um, for example, uh, so I mean, this can, uh, I can apply this to something I'm doing or to something I am not doing, but I could do. Um, uh, so like if I'm walking, then this is one of Locke's examples. If I'm walking, then I'm walking freely, or I'm, I'm, you know, uh, that action of walking is free if whether I continue walking or stop depends on which I prefer. And similarly, if I'm standing still, you can say I'm free to walk if whether I start walking or continue to stand still depends on which I prefer. Um, so, but either way, the point is whether I do it or refrain from doing it, that's what forbear means, right? If I, like, uh, that is, don't do it. <laughs> if I do it, whether I do it or don't do it depends on which I choose. Now, of course, you can only have this power, this says prefer. Prefer or that is choose. Of course, this power only makes sense if you can actually choose something. Right? So um, as we saw at 144, Hobbes deprives freedom in such a way that you can literally say that inanimate objects are free or not free. But uh, Locke is not defining it in a way like that, right? Locke is defining liberty, at least here. I wonder if this applies to his definition in the second treatise. Well, anyway, he's, at least here, Locke is defining liberty in such a way that only uh, a being that can choose can be said to be free or not free, basically. Well, I guess they could, all the others could be said to be not free. But anyway, only a being that can choose can be said to be free because um, it can't depend, what, what I do can't depend on what I choose unless I can choose. So um, to have this power that we call freedom or liberty, we have to have another power. And this is, what Locke says we call the will, which is the power to choose. Right, so again, the will is a, it's a power, it's a faculty, it's a capability. What is it a capability to do? It's the capability of preferring one thing over another or choosing one thing over another. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's some question about exactly what the right, that Locke goes into about exactly what the right word is here, choose, prefer, whatever. But, uh, but basically you can understand what this means, right? So, uh, like, um, you know, uh, um. Well, actually, there's something tricky about what this means, but let me just say, you know, so um, when I, you know, I always have the capability to prefer walking to standing still or vice versa, but when I'm actually preferring one to the other, preferring, choosing, preferring it in such a way that it, it's intended to lead to action or something like that, then that's the operation of the will or volition. As that's an operation of the will, a volition. Um, so, um, okay, so this explanation of freedom and will as two different powers, the first thing Locke gets out of this is to say that when you ask, is our will free, you're asking something that doesn't make any sense. Because he says, if I wrote this in a way that's kind of hard to read.
So, um, uh, because uh, to ask whether this power is free is to ask whether this power has a certain power. And Locke says that doesn't make any sense. Only substances have powers, not powers. Um, right, this is what he's talking about in Book 2, Chapter 21, Section 14, on page 25. Um. For if I mistake not, it follows from what I have said, that the question itself is altogether improper, and it is as insignificant to ask whether a man's will be free as to ask whether his sleep be swift or his virtue square, liberty being as little applicable to the will as swiftness of motion is to sleep or squareness to virtue. Um... And as he goes on to say at the end of the paragraph to explain this, liberty, which is but a power, belongs only to agents and cannot be an attribute or modification of the will, which is also but a power. Right, so like to, to make this clearer, I guess you could, I could bring in the examples that Locke discusses of the power to dance and the power to sing. And, you know, he says like, would it make sense to ask if the power to dance has the power to sing? No, the power to dance doesn't have any powers. It is a power that I have, right? So I can ask whether I have both of those powers or only one of them, but not whether one of those powers has another power. Um, um, Now, I guess it's possible you could raise some questions about this. Is it really so absurd to talk about a power, have another power? Um, I mean, at least this seems to take for granted, and Locke says this outright, I think, in this uh, chapter, that these mental faculties are not real powers, right? So they're not things in their own right. They're bare powers, which is interesting, if that's true, if all mental faculties are bare powers, then that means that there's a significant difference between sensation and reflection as sources of knowledge. It means that, re that in reflection there are no uh, primary qualities, no ideas of primary qualities, right? Because every quality that causes us to perceive something in reflection will turn out to be a bare power. Um, that's interesting, um, but, um, I think more to the point, you, I mean, your reaction to this might be, and probably should be, well, okay, fine, like, all right, that's not what we meant to ask, Locke, right? I mean, obviously, when I asked whether the will was free, I didn't mean to ask whether my power to choose has a power to do things or not, whether how, depending on what I choose, what it chooses, right? <laughs> uh, I, uh, what was I asking? And well, so basically, again, remembering that the will is a power, volition is the operation of that power. And it's an active power, I guess. It's actually not so clear when we come to the rest of what Locke says about it, but it's an act of power. It seems like it's something I do. I choose this. So we can ask about 
not the faculty, not whether the faculty of will has a power of freedom, but whether my exercise of the faculty of will is free or not. In other words, does that operation or vol of volition take place or not depending on what I choose? Um, do people understand the difference between these two questions? Like what we actually asked according to Locke, which he says is absurd, and what clearly we meant to ask? All right, so two people say yes. <laughs> I'll count that as everyone saying yes. All right, so, um, right, so we meant to ask Locke was not whether this power has another power. We meant to ask, roughly speaking, whether this, um, whether this power applies to the acts of this power, or operations of this power, or not. Um, so, um, like similarly, we could ask, is the dancing faculty free? And we mean by that something like, am I free to dance or not to dance? Um, in that case, the answer would be sometimes yes, sometimes no, right? Like, you know, if I'm in chains, I'm not free to dance. Or if someone's cast a spell of dancing on me and I can't stop dancing, as Ivy and Bean try to do in this one book, uh, then I'm not free because I I can't stop dancing if I prefer to stop dancing. All right. Um, so uh, so I mean that might be the answer here too. But anyway, that's you know that's the question: Am I free to will or not to will? Now, th it, so Locke does go on then and consider that question instead, right? So I mean he. Um, he doesn't just stop with this kind of tricky point that, that, you know, what we actually said doesn't make any sense or something like that. He does go on to answer the question um, that uh, we were actually asking, or two versions of the question we were actually asking. But I think, I mean, there's a reason he starts with this in any case, which is that by defining the two this way, he's already making clear um, um, that what we're that what we're really asking is, although not nonsense, unreasonable. So, okay, so what are we really asking? So, like I said, we're really asking whether we're free to will or not to will. So there's actually two ways of understanding that, though. One is, am I free to either will something or will nothing at all? Right? So in other words, if you think of the power of, of the power that is the will as the power to will anything, the question is, like just as the power to walk is the power to walk, period. And so that, you know, I'm free in exercising the power to walk if I can not walk at all. Um, so then I'm free in exercising the will if I can not will at all. And um, so Locke answers that one first, and he says, um, that, um, and so maybe I should write, you know, where do I write this? No. That's not just where I just write it So in other words, OK, 
and I'm not will at all if I so choose. So that is, can I will to stop willing for now? Um, so some April just asks, is that basically defining freedom by comparison? Comparison of not being able to do it. Well, Sorry, that might be kind of a strange wording. I can try and explain it a little bit better what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, ultimately it's saying the answer will be yes, so long as we have like the binary choice of both being able to do and not being able to do. Given both options, we assume yes. You mean in general, like, am I free to walk or whatever? Then the question is, yeah. can I do yeah. it or not do it? Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, there's cases where... Um, there's cases where I want to do what I'm actually doing. Right? So Locke mentions being, you know, like... When I'm asleep, I'm kidnapped and brought into a room with someone I really want to see. And then the door is locked. So I wake up and I'm like, oh, great, someone I really want to see. So I want to be sitting in that room. But I'm not sitting in that room freely because I'm not free to stop sitting in that room if I, if I didn't want to. Right? So, um, so it's both. it has to be both. Free to do it. I, I can do it if I prefer, and I cannot do it if I prefer not to do it, then I can be said to be freely doing it or freely not doing it or whatever. Um, okay, so anyway, so getting back to this. So, so the first question Locke considers, when we ask, like what did we really mean when we asked whether the will is free is we meant something like, can I choose in a particular case not to will at all? So, and he says, no, evidently we can't, at least not once the action is proposed to us, whatever that means exactly, like once we've thought of it or something like that. So he says, like, for example, suppose I'm walking along um, and now somehow I'm faced with the question whether I prefer to keep walking or stop walking. So he says, well, um, and I guess, I mean, we're supposed to assume in this case that I'm walking freely. Otherwise, this whole argument won't work at all. I'm walking freely, right? So I get to this point where I, I think to myself, do I prefer to continue walking or stop walking? And, you know, added information, whether I continue walking or stop walking is to depend on what I prefer. So then Locke says, well, look, I either have to continue walking or stop walking. There's no third alternative. That's the law of excluded middle. So um, I either have to start, I have to have to continue walking or stop walking. And since which happens depends on what I prefer, I have to prefer one. Um, that's the argument. Uh, there's some weird things about it. In particular, it seems like it seems like this definition is taken in a, or is made stronger to make that argument work. It's not only that if I prefer to do it, I will do it. And if I prefer not to do it, I will not do it. But it's if and only if, right? Like, um, you know, I will do it if and only if I prefer to do it. And I will not do it only if and only if I prefer not to do it. Then it follows that since I must either do it or not do it, I must either prefer to do it or not, or, or prefer not to do it. But if it's just if, then we don't know what will happen if I prefer neither. So, um, the um, the stronger definition makes it a matter of logical necessity that we can't not will, but it seems to have been put in by definition. 
Um, all right, I, I'm not going to go on about that because if if you if you understood, I just said good, and if not, forget about it. Um, but um, but anyway, I mean, um, leaving aside how good Locke's argument is at this point, but um, the question here. I mean, this is a real question, and it's a serious question that um, that some of Locke's predecessors are answering differently than he answers it, right? Like, for example, it's very important to Descartes that we can suspend judgment. And it's very important to uh, others, partly Descartes is basing himself on their doctrines, like the ancient Stoics and ancient skeptics, right, that we can suspend judgment. So we can, you know, neither assent to something nor reject it. And I think Descartes and the Stoics and the skeptics think that's true in the case where the action is believing or not believing something or judging, but it's also true in the case where the action is a more usual type of action, like doing something or not doing it. We can suspend our will between the two. If we have no good reason for either, we cannot choose either. So Locke is saying, no, that's impossible. So that is kind of important, and yet, nevertheless, I think it's clear we still haven't got to what's really bothering people when they ask whether the will is free. Right? They're not, they're, or to put it this way, like the question of whether the will is free um, comes along with a certain feeling of that we would be trapped if it's not. Um, but the, right, like, that's kind of the, the, I don't know what, um, that's kind of the, the fear that motivates the question. But the fear is not the fear that I might be forced to choose one or the other, um, right, that of necessity, when I'm in this situation, I'm walking, I have to either prefer to keep walking, or I have to prefer to stop walking. Really, the necessity that's at least maybe leaving some cases aside, like Descartes or whatever, the, really the, the necessity that's bothering me is the necessity of doing one of them, like the one I actually do. Right. So, so what I'm, you know, if I decide to continue walking, then I ask myself kind of like, was I trapped into choosing that? Was I like forced to choose that? Right? So the question that's actually being asked here is um, not, are we free to will or not to will at all? The question is, are we free to will this or to will the opposite? So, I mean, it's kind of a different way of understanding what it is that we want to be able to do or forbear doing. Right, like, um, is that how you spell forbear? All right, I'm terrible spelling. All right, um, so, um, oh, someone asked, so power is just the ability to do something even if you can't do it. No, I mean, if you can't do it, you don't have the power to do it. Um, even if you don't do it, you have the power to do it. All right, so anyway, so, so getting back to this, right? So the question is not, can I will, can I not will at all, but can I, can I not will this if I so choose? Right? So the question we're asking is, and this question is not nonsense, at least not in the way that the first question that Locke talked about was nonsense. The question is, um, you know, so choosing is, choosing to walk is something I do, just like walking is something I do. And, and choosing not to walk is something else I do. And the question is, 
will which of those I do depend on my preference. So if I prefer to choose to walk, will I choose to walk? Whereas if I prefer not to choose to walk, will I not choose to walk? And, you know, I mean, I could be free to choose even if I'm not free to walk or not to walk, right? In other words, maybe I'm in chains, <laughs> so I can't actually walk, but I can still decide whether I'd rather be walking or not. And the question is, does that decision itself depend on my choice? Um, so I think um, it's pretty clear that's mainly the question people have in mind, at least, or at least the closest Locke with his metaphysics and so forth can come to the question I have in mind when I ask, is the will free? Right, because, it, so, because the reason I'm feeling trapped is I say, sure, the fact that I continued walking depended on my preference to keep walking, but my preference to keep walking depended on something else. Um, and if the something else it depended on wasn't itself my choice, then it's like something made me choose this. So I'm not really free. That's, the, that's the, the feeling that makes us want to ask this question. And so I think that's the, the it's only at, when Locke considers that third question that he's really engaging with the question of whether the will is free. And the answer to that third question is no, again, and obviously not, so, right? So this is, um, Book 2, Chapter 21, Section 25, on page 230. Um. Um. For to ask whether a man be at liberty to will either motion or rest, speaking or silence, which he pleases, is to ask whether a man can will what he wills, or be pleased with what he is pleased with, a question which I think needs no answer, and they who can make a question of it must suppose one will to determine the acts of another, and another to determine that, and so on in infinitum. Right, so his answer is no, obviously not. That would be an infinite regress, right? If I'm, so, you know, I'm saying, like, whether I'm going to walk or not depends on my will, that is, on what I choose. And now I want what I choose to depend on my will. So I want to choose what, what to choose. But, of course, then I'm going to ask, well, what about that choice? Doesn't that have to depend on what I choose? So I'm going to keep going back and back and back, and there have to be, if, if my will were free in the way, I mean, I think... To to make what he's saying here a little bit more precise, because, uh, like, obviously, in some sense, like, the answer could be, and I guess maybe even Locke would agree, is sometimes yes, right? Like, sometimes I can kind of think about what it would be better to, to prefer and try to change my preference based on that or something. That's something that people these days might call a second order volition, or I'm not sure whether I really buy those orders or not. But anyway, um, anyway, like whether it's a different order or whatever, it's, it seems like sometimes we might have a preference as to what to prefer. We might work to try to prefer what we think it would be better to prefer. Um, but I think what Locke is saying is, you know, but, um, this thing that's making you not satisfied with freedom, meaning just this, is, um, could only really be satisfied by an infinite number of choices. Right, and there is maybe sometimes it's true as a fact that we choose what to choose, but the but but the main point is this that whether I choose what to choose or not, I'm free when what I do depends on what I choose. And if I don't think that's enough freedom, 
right? If I don't think it counts as free, un if I don't think anything ever counts as free, unless I chose to make the choice, then I'm never going to be satisfied with any finite number of choices. There's going to have to be an infinite series of choices leading up to any action, which um, if you assume, as Locke always does, and as most people traditionally do, that an infinite series is one that you can never get through, means that you could never do anything. So, um, so, the, so again, the answer is, given that we do things, obviously, no. The things we do do not depend on an infinite number of choices. Um... So, like, the way he's put this, I think it's a little bit tricky that it would be easy to read this without noticing that what Locke basically has said is that, no, the will is not free. <laughs> right? In other words, because he first said the dispute whether the will is free is an absurd metaphysical wrangling. It's based on a mistake, right? So then you kind of feel like he's going like to come down saying neither side is right. But the truth is, he, when he really goes on to explain what it is they must really be arguing about, um, then he states a question that he, that he can answer that's not nonsense, and the answer is no. Um, um, so, okay, are there questions about that before I go on? All right. Um, so you might well ask then, Locke, okay, so it's not my choice that determines which I choose, right? So the will is a power to choose, that is to choose one or the other. Now, of course, uh, he's just established that he must choose one or the other. At least he seems he thinks he's established that. Um, but of course, I, I of course I can't choose both. So something has to decide which operation is going to happen. Right? That is, the faculty or power of will is equally the power to choose either one. So. Um, something else has to come in to decide which one is actually going to happen. Um, right, and I mean, there's nothing particularly mysterious about this situation in general, right? Like the power of vision is the power to see something white, and it's also the power to see something black. So what determines whether I see something white or something black? Well, it's what happens to actually come in front of my eyes, <laughs> right? That's what determines it. Um, um, so what the question is, what's analogous to that in the case of will? And the answer, according to Locke, is pleasure and pain. So I guess if I had to erase all of this stuff, and just write, what determines the will? The answer Locke is rejecting is that what determines the will is the will. Or that the will determines itself, um, is self-determining, right? It has self-determination, as we say. All of all of that talk of self-determination and so forth comes basically out of Kant's attempt to get around um, Locke, and not just Locke, but Locke and Leibniz's arguments here. Um, but in any case, 
So, right, so Locke says, no, the will cannot determine itself. For the will to determine itself would require that I choose what to choose, and I choose to choose what to choose, and I choose to choose to choose what to choose, etc., ad infinitum. So what does determine the will? And the answer is pleasure and pain. Right, what makes me prefer one thing to another is um, that my expectation that I will get more pleasure and or less pain from that choice. Um, So that's why I said, actually, it's not so clear that we should call the will an active faculty, according to Locke. Um, it works kind of like vision, in fact. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it's a little more complicated than vision, uh, or maybe I should say it's subject to more illusions than vision or something like that. But in any case, uh, like ultimately what determines which way I'm going to choose is like the way external things are set up to cause pleasure and pain. Um, so... Um, Right, and I mean, if you think back to book one, when he was discussing practical principles, he already said this. He said, you know, there is no practical principle in the sense of a proposition that we know that guides, that, that's in, there is no innate practical principle in the sense of something that we're born knowing that guards all our choices. But there is something like an innate practical principle that is, there's an innate, um, uh, more than just a tendency. There's an innate law to, to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And that we see constantly operating our wills without exception from the time we're born. Um, right, so this is what's sometimes known as psychological hedonism. Right? as opposed to right? as opposed to ethical hedonism. So ethical hedonism says that the good is pleasure and therefore you ought to choose pleasure or something like that. Um, psychological hedonism says you do choose pleasure. As a matter of fact, people always choose pleasure and avoid pain. Um, so, so far, this is not an ethical view, what Locke is saying. It's a, I guess, psychological view. And I mean, uh, that terminology of psychology, the word is actually ancient. I just figured that out again. But it's not doesn't become very common until the 19th century. So, um, right, so Locke wouldn't describe it as psychological, but anyway, you know, it's it's, it's just uh, like it's it's like a um, piece of natural philosophy about human beings, what we do. Um, so. Um, but although it's not, this isn't itself an ethical theory, it does def drive Locke's definition of morality in chapter 28 of book two. So, um, so this is near the beginning of, sorry, it's not near the beginning of chapter 28. That's, and that's important. The title of chapter 28 is um, Of Other Relations. Right? After he gets through discussing some important relations like cause and effect and identity and whatever, then there's a chapter called Of Other Relations, which doesn't sound very interesting. And then the first relations he discusses, as a matter of fact, are not very interesting, right? Like he discusses the relation expressed by a word like whiter or hotter. 
And then he discusses like family relationships, like the relationship of father and son and stuff like that. Um, uh, I probably, I think I said this in 144 too, but I get that I have to keep remembering that there's only a few students who were in 144 last quarter who are in this course now. So I have to say everything again, um, that um, it's possible that Locke, it's strange that Locke's main discussion of the fundamentals of his ethical theory in the essay are buried in the middle of a chapter called Of Other Relations after discussion of some really boring other relations. And it's possible that this is, I mean, this is a technique that authors can use if they don't want all readers to reach a certain discussion or they don't want it to get too much attention, at least from a certain kind of readers. Um, because, so I didn't assign the beginning of chapter 28, <laughs> but if I had assigned all of chapter 28 and if you had started at the beginning, you might have considered uh, this chapter seems skippable. But, um, but then when we get to section five, all of a sudden he starts talking about good and evil and moral relations. So, um, so, uh, chap book two, chapter 28, section five on page 316. There's gotta be a better way of doing this too. It would be a better way of doing everything. Okay, so good and evil, as hath been shown, I don't know if he so much shows it as just defines good and evil this way, but anyway, as has been shown in chapter 20 and chapter 21, are nothing but pleasure or pain, or that which occasions or procures pleasure or pain to us. This definition is the same as Hobbes' definition of good and evil. Um, it doesn't mean that good and evil are exactly the same as pleasure and pain, but it means that what's, what I call good is either pleasure, pleasure for who? Pleasure for me, right? So when I say something is good, I mean either it's pleasure for me or it's like fit to obtain pleasure for me, right? So it's either in itself pleasant or it's useful. And similarly, when I call something evil, I mean either it's pain for me or it's suitable to obtain pain for me. So it's uh, whatever the opposite of useful is. All right. Morally good and evil. Oh, so sorry. So that's good and evil in general. Then he says, so I mean, obviously that on that definition of good and evil, we're not talking in particular about moral good and evil. Right? Like we're talking about, you know, if I eat a hamburger and I say, hmm, that's good, I mean, it, it, you know, I got pleasure from it. <laughs> um, it also, by the way, if you say that's not good, we're not really arguing with each other. Because when you say it's not good, you don't mean it doesn't cause me pleasure. It means it doesn't cause you pleasure. And it can be perfectly clear, like, for example, if what causes me pleasure is hitting you over the head then I'm going to say it's good and you're going to say it's evil. <laughs> um, right, so we're not talking about moral good and evil. So you might think moral good and evil is some other completely different meaning of good and evil, but Locke says no. It's a specific type of pleasure and pain or a specific way of procuring pleasure and pain. Morally good and evil, then, is only the good and evil that is drawn that is drawn on us from the will and power of the lawmaker. Which good and evil, pleasure or pain, attending our observance or breach of the law by the decree of the lawmaker is that we call reward and punishment. So, um, hold on a second.
So morally, so when we when I say an action is morally good, can I leave this up here or not? Maybe not can leave this up. All right. Because we've gone on from this to, to this now, right? So when I say an action is morally good. I mean, so out of those two things, pleasant or useful, this falls under useful, basically. Right? I don't mean that the action is immediately pleasant to me. I mean that it's fit to procure pleasure. But not just any way of being fit to procure pleasure makes it count as morally good or evil, right? Like, in other words, if buying a hamburger will procure me pleasure, that doesn't make the action of buying a hamburger morally good. It has to be fit to procure pleasure in a particular way. Due to the will of a lawmaker. So when I'm asking whether an action is morally good or evil, according to Locke, I'm asking, is it fit to procure me pleasure or pain because it's, it's either um, in accord with or a violation of a certain law? Which law is going to be enforced by the lawmaker? And that's where the pleasure, pleasure and pain are going to come from. Right? So, like, if there's a law against buying hamburgers and I go and buy a hamburger, then um, relative to that law, my action was morally evil. Why is it morally evil? Because the lawgiver, whoever uh, set up that law and is enforcing it, actually, he's not making the distinction here that he makes in the second treatise so clearly between the executive and the legislative. And it's kind of the it's kind of the same. But anyway, the person who set up that law and is enforcing it um, is going to cause me pain because I did that action. And therefore, that action was fit to procure me pain due to the will of the lawmaker. And that's what we mean by calling it morally evil. Um, and, um, um, you know, you might ask, wait, couldn't there be a law that you ought to follow even though it's not enforced by pleasure and pain? Right? Couldn't it be that the lawmaker has told you to do something, and even though they can't enforce it, you ought to do what the lawmaker said? So Locke says, and this is where the psychological hedonism comes in, so maybe I shouldn't have erased it. For since it would be utterly in vain to suppose a rule set to the free actions of man without annexing to it some enforcement of good and evil to determine his will, we must, wherever we suppose a law, suppose also some reward or punishment annexed to that law. He goes on, it would be in vain for one intelligent being to set a rule to the actions of another if he had it not in his power to reward the compliance with and punish um, deviation from his rule by some good and evil that is not the natural product and consequence of the action itself. Um... Right? So the answer, again, the question is, couldn't there be a law that I ought to obey even though there's not going to be any enforcement of it? And Locke says, well, no. I mean, if there isn't going to be any enforcement of it, you won't obey it. Because your will is determined by pleasure and pain, right? So you won't obey it if there's not going to be any enforcement. Well, of course, 
you might obey it for some other reason, right? Like, in other words, if, there, if, if I like hamburgers and there's a law that says that I must buy hamburgers, I must be getting hungry. Why am I using hamburgers as an example? Uh, anyway, <laughs> there's a law that says I must buy hamburgers, um, th if, and it's not enforced, then I might go buy hamburgers anyway because, it, as a matter of fact, I get pleasure from the hamburger, right? But... Um, uh, but that's a natural consequence of the action that has nothing to do with whether it's in conformity to this law or not. So unless there's reward and punishments, I'm not going to obey this law because it's a law. Right? If I do happen to obey it, it will be for some other irrelevant reason. If I'm going to obey this law because it's a law, then there must be the, the person who set up the law must have annexed some special pleasure and pain just to observing or violating the law respectively. So now I'm going to obey it because it's a law, meaning because someone has set it up and combined it with rewards and punishments as to determine my will. Um, what was the question here in the chat? If you do something that will cause you pain but you believe to be morally right, are you acting against your will? So Locke says, you won't do something that you believe that you believe will cause you pain, unless you believe it will cause you more pleasure in the long run, or something like that, or unless you somehow forget the pain that it's going to cause you, and you're not paying attention, right? Like I said, this uh, when I, I said this is not as as this is subject to more illusions than vision is. You know, like um, it's easy to not keep in mind certain sources of pleasure and pain if they're far in the future or whatever, to discount them, to forget about them completely. But um, but assuming I'm actually have in mind the pain that it's going to cause me, I won't do it. That was the claim. Pleasure and pain is what determines the will. So if I obey an action because it's morally right, that is because it's morally good, it must mean, according to Locke, it must mean this. I do it because I expect to get pleasure from it due to the fact that it's in accordance with the moral law. That's the only way of explaining it. Right, and that's why he says it would be in vain to set a law that was not annexed to rewards and punishments. It would be in vain because I would be telling you to do something, but there would be no reason for you to do it. So you wouldn't. <laughs> um, or anyway, you wouldn't do it because I told you. If you did it, it would be for some other reason. So one way or the other, I'm was wasting my breath. Um, So that's a little unsettling, but that is, is what Locke is saying. And moreover, it has this consequence. And this is why um, moral good and evil are discussed in the, section, in the chapter on other relations. Um, or at least this is why moral and good and evil are discussed on some chapter on relations. Because um, this definition makes the question of whether something is morally good or evil relative to a choice of lawmaker. Right? So this is a version of what's called moral relativism. Remember, I was talking last time about like predicates or that that um, or denominations that seem to be absolute but are actually relative, um, right? So kind of relativism is claiming that about something that seems to be absolute, right? So like if someone thought bigness was absolute, something is either big or not, and you just have to look at that thing to tell, then I can come along and say, no, I'm a relativist about bigness, meaning 
I think there's a hidden relation. When you say something is big, you mean big compared to some standard, right? And so if you if like you haven't told me what standard, I can't decide whether it's big or not. Now, I mean, the standard may, uh, we may not notice it because the standard is always like automatically chosen for us in a certain situation, right? Like we don't have to think when we say that's a big tree normally about what the standard's gonna be for calling it big. We know if you say it's a big tree, you're comparing it to the usual size of trees around here or something like that, right? So, um, uh, but nevertheless, you know, whether it's supplied kind of by default or whether you choose it deliberately, you have to fill in the other term of the relation to be able to decide whether it applies or not. So moral relativism is saying that about moral good and evil, and this means that Locke is a moral relativist in the following sense. When you say something is morally good, there's a hidden relation, right? I should ask you, morally good compared to what law? To which law? And by which law, I mean not like which paragraph in the code, but I mean which lawgiver, right? Like which kind of law, which system of law are you comparing it to? And if you compare it to different systems of law, the answer is going to come out different, right? So if there's two lawmakers, and one of them makes a law that you should buy hamburgers, and the other one makes a law that you shouldn't buy hamburgers, then unless I tell you which lawmaker I'm referring to, you're, you know, you're not sure whether to say buying Hamburg is good or evil, morally good or evil. Um, and sure enough, in the case of one of the three laws that, law, that Locke discusses, so um, the three laws that Locke discusses are the... Um, the divine law, the civil law, and the law of virtue. And in the case of the law of virtue, he says that the law we compare actions to in this respect is the opinions of the people around us our associates, right? Not necessarily the people who are closest to us in space, sort of, but the, the people, the crowd that we're part of, basically, right? Um, what we consider is their opinions, and the reward is that if we follow that law of opinion, they'll have good opinion of us. And if we don't, they'll have a bad opinion. That would be the punishment. They'll have a bad opinion of us, right? And he says, and if you think that's not a... Um, it's significant reward and punishment. You don't know much about human nature. <laughs> it says, on the contrary, that's the one that weighs heavily on it, most heavily on us all the time. Um, but, so, um, but so with respect to this, the law of virtue, this is basically a form of um, cultural moral relativism, which is probably the type of moral relativism that we're most familiar with, right? Where you say that, like, what's morally good, um, you know, among cannibals in the inland New Guinea is not the same as what's morally good among uh, um, venture capitalists, you know, whatever. I, maybe, why was I, I trying to choose two examples? I didn't want to choose one example. That's too complicated. Yeah, let me let me just go ahead. You know, what's morally good and evil in France might not be the same as what's morally good and evil in England. Why? Because um, people have a different opinion about what actions ought to be done and what actions ought not to be done. Um, uh, and... Uh, so you're comparing it to different laws when you ask about someone in France. You're comparing it to the opinion of the French people they associate with. When you ask about the person in England, you're comparing it to the opinion of the English people they associate with. And so depending on the culture, whether more narrowly or more broadly, broadly considered, you're going to get a different system of moral good and evil. And when he talks about this, Locke actually brings all the usual type of examples uh, that 
cultural moral relativists still use, right? He'll, you know, the, both when he talks about it in book one, when he's talking about innate practical principles, and when he brings it up again here, he says, you know, um, there's lots of places where they think where they think the you know, the things we think are really bad, they think are great. <laughs> and they count as virtues. And we count them as vices and, and vice versa. So um, so what gets Locke, and you know, by the way, obviously the civil law, so in the civil law, the lawmaker is, and again, he's not making a distinction between the legislative and executive powers but of the commonwealth but he said law, the the lawmaker is the commonwealth the state the government and the rewards and punishments well usually it's more punishments right than rewards but anyway <laughs> um which he says so he doesn't explain why but anyway like the punishments are the usual type of punishments that we would think of right like being put in prison or whatever so um, um, this too, of course, is going to be different in different places, right? Depending on what the civil law is, where you are, whether something is morally good or evil in that sense is going to depend on where you are, what government you're living under. Um, And the thing that gets Locke out, however, of the kind of ultimate consequence of moral relativism that then, all right, well, I guess it's just, you know, there's nothing absolute to say about what's morally good and evil, is that there's this first law, the divine law. Now, he says whether it's re by revelation or by reason, um, but I think it's pretty clear, both from this book and from the second treatise, that um, revelation isn't going to add any new laws that we can't find out by reason. Um, if, it, if it did, there would be a problem with what I'm about to say. But so according to Locke, reason always, no matter where you apply it, if you start thinking about what God would want you to do or want you not to do, if you reason correctly, you'll always reach the same conclusion. Doesn't matter who your associates are, doesn't matter what government you're living under. So there's only one of these divine laws, or law of reason, as he also sometimes calls it. Or sometimes he calls it the law of nature. Um, Now, I mean, so we still have this question, oh, but what happens when these conflict, as they well may, right? Even So now I'm not talking about two people in different places, but one person in the same place. The law of virtue may tell them to do one thing. The law, the civil law may tell them to do something else. The divine law may tell them to do a third thing. Right? Uh, I'm not sure if I can think of an example off the top of my head with all, where all three are different. I should have thought about this before. But, like, you know, if dueling is considered virtuous by your associates, but is illegal, and also if you think about it, you'll see that God wouldn't want you to do it, then we have a case where the law of virtue tells you to, to duel, right? Like, if you're challenged, to accept the challenge or whatever. And whereas these two tell you not to, so, um, what do we do to resolve these conflicts? Well, Locke says, what do we do? Same thing we always do. We decide where we're going to get more pain or pleasure. So where are we going to get more pain or, pain or pleasure? Well, and so, I mean, Locke has kind of two answers to this. One is the answer if you're really paying attention and thinking correctly, and the other, which is basically the, the opposite, <laughs> is the answer we tend to come up with. So the answer, if you're really thinking carefully, is that since 
And like, I, first of all, we haven't talked about Locke's proof that there is a God yet. He hasn't got to that yet himself. And I haven't talked about how we know, how reason can assure us that God wants us to do certain things either. But supposing reason could assure us that God wants us to do certain things and not to do other things. Well, so the, um, the pleasure, and I guess I should have said also, you know, and avoid pain, right? That is, the rewards and punishments that are going to come from this one, and for the most part we're talking about in the afterlife here, so we have to prove that exists too, <laughs> um, right? But the reward or pleasure that are going to come in the afterlife, um, um, this this divine lawmaker has infinite power to reward and punish, both in the sense of the amount of reward or punishment. And ultimately, remember the infinity for Locke has to be a matter of quantity, right? So both in the sense of the amount of reward or punishment and in the sense of the accuracy, right? I think as Locke said a long time ago uh, about the divine law, you know, that it's um, the will of a God who sees men in the dark, right? Meaning, right, you can't, like, this would be a lawmaker who will definitely know whether you've been naughty or nice and has infinite power to reward and punish. So if there's a conflict, um, if you think about it carefully, you always will follow that one, right? So you always would follow the law of reason, reason or the law of nature if you were thinking carefully about all the pain and pleasure that's really likely to result from the action. Um, and then probably secondly, you would think of this one, um, and thirdly, you would think of this one. But he says, in real life, we tend to never consider this one most of the time. Even those who believe in it mostly don't think about it most of the time. And as far as this one goes, yeah, people know the state can reward and punish, but they kind of think they'll get away with it, or they hope they'll get away with it and not be detected by the state. They flatter themselves um, with hopes of impunity, as Locke puts it. So in real life, it's actually this one that, as I said before, weighs most heavily on us most of the time. Right? People who would think not think twice about doing something immoral in the usual sense of the term, that is, against the divine law, or illegal, would really hesitate before doing something that their associates would um, that would bring them contempt from their associates. Um, okay, so there are questions. Are there questions about any of that so far? This, you know, by the way, this kind of, when Locke is going to prove the existence of God, this kind of sets the bar for what he has to prove, right? The important thing would be to prove that there's a being with, who knows exactly what we've done and is capable of rewarding or punishing it infinitely much, which, you know, I mean... Of course, infinitely much, as usual in Locke here, infinite just means more than any finite amount you stipulate, right? So what's necessary here is just that, like, however great the rewards and punishments from these two are, this can always be greater. That's what we, that's our idea of infinity, according to Locke. Um, that's what he would have to prove. Whether he actually succeeds whether his proof actually tends to prove that is a good question. And in part, that's like part of what we'll see Hume's character is worrying about in the dialogues on natural religion. Um, but, um, um, 
So for example, he doesn't really have to prove that there's a perfect infinite substance, at least not for these purposes. That's irrelevant. You know, God could be imperfect in all kinds of ways, as long as whatever God is has the ability to enforce this law perfectly. That's what we need as the basis for morality. All right. Um, okay. So, um, so what? So I mean, therefore, if we really pay attention according to Locke, the most important question we can ask is, okay, what is this divine law? Um, Now, um, now, I mean, um, first of all, why should we think that God has given a law at all? Um, so Locke says, this is, um, um, book two, chapter 28, section eight on page 317, the next page, that God has given a rule whereby men should, should govern themselves. I think there is nobody so brutish as to deny. He has a right to do it. We are his creatures. That's already a question there. What does it mean he has a right to do it? Like when you say, I have a right to do something, that means the law permits me to do it. But as normally, rights are relative to law, but now God, who's, no one's giving a law to God, right? So. Anyway, he has a right to do it. We are his creatures. He has goodness and wisdom to direct our actions to that which is best. And he has power to enforce it by rewards and punishments of infinite weight and duration, blah, blah, blah. Right? So this part that I underline in my text is the one part I want to call attention to here. Um, What does it mean to say that God has the goodness to direct our actions to that which is best? Um, well, you know, if it meant that God has the goodness to direct our actions to what is morally good, then... Um, um, that would be, is that circular? It would be empty, right? Like, because morally good just means, in this context, um, tending to bring us pleasure because of what God wants us to do. So um, God doesn't need any particular talent to, to tell us what is morally best to do. Whatever he tells us to do is, by definition, what's morally best to do. Um, so it must not mean that, oops, sorry, what, so what does it mean? Well, um, apparently what it means is this, um, we gather somehow that um, what what God wills is the preservation of human society or of the human species as a whole. Now, how we gather that is a good question, especially given the questions that Locke is going to bring up about the definition of human and stuff like that. Um, and maybe he doesn't really mean to say the human species as a whole. Maybe he means to say finite rational beings in general or something like that. But in any case, somehow or other we gather that what God wants is the good for all of us, the public good. Now, I mean, if you ask 
well, wait, what's the public good? Well, the answer is pleasure, right? And avoiding pain. <laughs> so, um, and I guess self, I guess preservation. Well, he doesn't really mention that separately the way Hobbes does. Um, But so in any case, right, so the things God wants us to do are the things that's, that are going to bring the most, that are useful, right? So again, we're in the category, as we must be, whenever we're talking about moral good and evil, in the category of useful, not immediately pleasant or painful. So the things that are useful for the public good, for the public, and that means ultimately for the public pleasure right so what god wills is actions with public utility now uh, in other words when i read uh, hume's second inquiry you know that this leads into a whole discussion in hume of public utility i'm not doing that this year i'm doing the other thing but anyway um uh, that's so So if you ask, how can we figure out what God wants us to do? Now, first of all, you have to grant that premise that what God wants is the public good. Right? That uh, God, first of all, wants good and not evil. That is, wants pleasure and not pain for creatures, generally speaking. And that, number two, doesn't play favorites. So um, if you grant that, then um, the way to figure out whether something is in accord with the divine law or a violation of the divine law is to ask whether it's the best thing to do for everyone. Um, so this is a kind of what later got called utilitarianism. Um, um, exactly what kind, I don't want to try to say that would, because I have to try to figure out what kinds of utilitarianism there are and so forth. But it is, right, it is saying that if you want to know what's morally good, in the most important sense of morally good, namely, what is morally good relative to the divine law, or the law of reason, or the law of nature, then what you have to ask is, what's good for everyone on the whole? Where everyone, it's a little bit unclear who that includes, or what. Um, but um, um, everyone on the whole and um, so you might say well okay so we're saying that God wants us to get pleasure doesn't that mean that the reward that's coming is the natural consequence of the action not from the will of the lawmaker Um, but I think the point is this, that um, what motivates me to act or not to act is my pleasure and pain. So... Um, so if there were no external reward and punishment, everyone would seek their own pleasure and avoid their own pain. Um, and we couldn't say that they should, shouldn't do that, really, because they would, right? Again, that's psychological hedonism. That's what we do. We seek our own pleasure and we try to avoid our own pain. I mean, by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean we act selfishly, right? Because that involves the question of whether, for example, the misfortune of others causes me pain, which to a certain extent it certainly does, right? So uh, at least in some situations, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean we act selfishly, but it does mean that on the whole, the principle I'm consulting is not the public utility, but my utility, right? So... Um, um, so the effect of the divine law giving here is 
to take those things that by our own reason we can figure out would be best for everyone and then align our individual wills with the universal will, the, that is what the will of the public would be if it had one will, so to speak. Um, and uh, this is uh, both closely connected to Locke's own political philosophy and Rousseau's political philosophy and also to the role of God and Kant's ethics. Um, and so on this issue, as in many others, Kant is actually like the God that Kant wants to prove the existence of is, cl is closer to Locke's God than to Leibniz's, for example. Um, and Kant's ethics is kind of going to get turned around the opposite way in a, in a way I won't try to explain, but it's still basically the same relationship. The rewards and punishments come in to balance the fact that acting in according to the universal will is not necessarily um, going to um, line up with my own private motivations. Okay, and so again, like I think it's pretty clear this is supposed to be something that in principle anyone anywhere could find, could figure out. I mean, he will sometimes, not as much in this book as in the second treatise, maybe because they're, he's arguing with Filmer, but he will sometimes quote the Bible, right, to in support of his points, but I think if you look carefully, he he always only does it in support. He, he, he never considers that to be an independent reason for something. He always has a rational argument. Um, and I think you can see why that's important, right? If the moral law is going to apply to everyone everywhere, the, the, the moral law par excellence, right, the, that is the divine law or the law of reason, then it has to be something that people who never heard of the Bible could still find out by themselves. And I, and I believe that is what Locke thinks. Okay. Are there questions about that? If not, I'll go on to talk about personal identity and whatever time is left. Okay. Oops. So the puzzle I kind of ended up with last time about identity is like, according to Locke, a relation is always between two things, but identity, that is sameness, seems to be a relation between a thing and itself. So there's only one thing, so how could that be? And um, Locke's solution is um, that it's kind of the same thing and kind of different. How can something be kind of the same thing and the kind of different? Well, it can be the same thing at two different times, right? So if this axis is time and this axis is space, then, um, you know, when I'm asking whether something is identical to something else, I'm asking, is this the same as this? So there's two things that the relation is between, or at least two ways of considering the same thing, or something like that, that provide two terms for the relation. So that's Locke's general theory of identity. Later, I'm going to contrast that with Hume's general theory of identity, which is almost the same, but kind of the opposite <laughs> again. But anyway, so this is Locke's general theory of identity. But then he uses the fact that this is the theory of identity to explain why identity itself is relative to the way you're considering things. So like, you know, for example, if I ask, is this the same piece of matter as this? The answer might be yes. But if I ask, 
is this the same oak tree as this? Supposing this piece of matter is an oak tree, the answer might be no. All the matter that's in the original oak tree might have been spread out in all kinds of places. So you know, that's the original, the original piece of matter is there. But meanwhile, what counts as the same oak tree is this other tree at this time, which doesn't contain the, any of the matter that was in the original oak tree. It doesn't look much like the original oak tree because it's much bigger and so forth. But this is what counts as the same oak tree. Right? So in other words, because identity is about what counts as the same thing at this time as something at this time, and there can be different ways of deciding what to count as the same thing depending on your purpose, um, there are different identity relations. Um, now, I mean, I could and should say a lot more about this. Oh, uh, someone said continuity. Is continuity a fair single word descriptor to personal identity or no? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, so continuity of something. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, or, you know, continuity. I mean, actually, it's going to be important to Locke's view of personal identity that it can be a break in continuity, that the identification can continue after a break. So, yeah, so let me say, so, like, but for oak tree identity, there's kind of continuity that's important. Whereas for piece of matter identity, there's a different kind of continuity that's important. Right? So to count as the same piece of matter, like, it has to have, contain the same tiny bodies that, you know, have moved continuously over time to somewhere else. To count as the same oak tree, there has to be a certain life process that continues from one to the other, right? This, this one is the result of, you know, through the intermediate stages of the nutrients that this one drew in and so on and so forth. So that's, so that continuity of life makes it count as the same oak tree Whereas a different kind of continuity would make it count as the same piece of matter. Now, there's only two minutes left, so I'm going to say this quickly. So Locke makes a distinction between identity of a man. And I haven't even got to the other two things on my list at all, which is bad. But, oh well. Identity of a man and identity... Of a person. And by man, here he means human being. Right? So a man, identity of a human being is basically like identity of an oak tree, he says. It's the identity of a certain living body. Meaning, you know, if I ask, is this the same human being now as that one was earlier? I look to see whether there's a continuous life process that joins one to the other, and that determines the answer. But he says, when we ask whether it's the same person, we're asking a different question. And he says, person is a forensic term. Meaning it's like a legal term, or it's a term relative to reward and punishment. And someone now counts as the same person as someone earlier, if the person now is responsible for the actions of the earlier person. That is, if they can be um, reasonably rewarded or punished for those actions. And Locke says, and I don't have time to go into everything weird about this. I don't know what I might have time to talk about next time, but I'm going to have to talk about association of ideas at least next time. So it seems to be worse this year, even though it should be better. I don't know. Anyway, um, um, uh, without going into the details of it, you know, Locke says, 
who counts as the same person then? Well, it's the person who remembers or who could remember having carried out those actions earlier. He assumes there's exactly one or at most one person now who remembers carrying out those actions or could remember carrying out those actions earlier. Um, um, not clear how to back that up. But anyway, he assumes that. So you just have to find whether there's a person who remembers or could remember having done those earlier actions. And that's the person who could be justly rewarded or punished. Justly in what sense? Well, that's the person whose reward and punishment, whose threatened reward and punishment could have influenced the past person. The person I want to have pleasure and not suffer pain in the future is the person in the future who's going to remember being me now. That's the basic idea here. So even if, like, at time zero there was a man or a human being who went along doing some stuff, and then at a certain time, that human being died. So there's no continuity of life, life past that. But then, like later, at time one zillion, the last day, the day of judgment, a new human being comes into existence, not continuous in life processes with this one at all, but it remembers being this one. That's the same person. Okay. Um, that's all I have time to say now. Maybe I'll say more about it next time or not. I don't know. Um, I will see you Tuesday. Bye.